Welcome back to Goldmark TV. I've got two things to show you today. Later on, I'm going to be looking at a wonderful painting by Roderick Barrett. It's a fantastic picture of a chair, very typical of his work. A really enigmatic painting. I'm looking forward to showing that to you. But first, I thought I would take you for a little tour through some of the Picasso posters that we have here at the gallery. Now I know that recently Mike Goldmark, the boss, walked around and showed the wonderful poster show that we have here in the gallery front room uh, and gave you a flavour of all the different artists, the huge names in uh, 20th century European art uh, who uh, produced posters for their exhibitions. I thought we'd take a look at Picasso's today in particular because there's some interesting stories behind them and because we're able to see posters right from the very uh, start of this sort of last period of his life like this one over my shoulder, right to the very end. I hope you enjoy looking through these today. Posters really bookend Picasso's career. The very first couple that he made, he made right back when he was only 19 years old, at the very, very start of his career, living in Barcelona. He made them for competition. I think one of them got a runner-up place. At the time, he was a nobody, quite literally. He signed his first ever poster with a single P and closed with a circle in the manner of Bonnard, who was a great master of, of Belle Epoque poster making. Had that been it, had that been the end to Picasso's career, there'd be no suggestion, no way of knowing that this was a work by a man who, by the time he came to make his first set of later posters, was the greatest, certainly the best known artist in the world. It was almost 50 years, half a century, between those first abortive attempts at poster making, trying to establish a name for himself, before he came to posters again, uh, directly after the Second World War. By the time he came back to the medium, back to the idea of making posters in the first place, really he had done everything in his career that he was to do. He had become the artist that we know him today. Every subject, every theme, every way of working from the early African-inspired uh, pictures, the Cubist pictures, through to the neoclassical, that early blue and rose period, right up into this last uh, chapter of his life when he was trying to, uh, to deal with the sort of the major uh, themes uh, in, in his career. He had done it all, essentially. He came back to poster making much as he did so many other things in his career. Casually, almost by chance, almost allowing the possibilities of this new thing to sort of seduce him, to, to become uh, aware of the potential in poster making. So you can see from this poster over my shoulder, the first set that he made later in his career after those very first attempts right at the start. He made, not to promote necessarily just his own work, but to promote the town of Valery, where he had started to work with a local pottery, the Madura pottery. is one of the very first posters for that exhibition over here. So if you follow me along here, uh, we've got some more posters from that period. You can see from the style of these, from the, uh, the marks across the image, that these have been made in lino cut. It was almost exactly the same time in this post-war period that Picasso, when he came back to poster making, had also discovered ceramics in the town of Valerie, had got a feel for the, uh, the potential of the medium, had tried decorating some plates, some, some vases, and felt there might be something there. It was almost exactly the same time that he was also introduced to the medium of lino cut. He became a sort of icon, a figurehead for Valerie, and he'd been asked by the town to help promote its ceramics fairs, its local bullfights, to make some posters for them that they could put up around town and, and advertise uh, this, the, the sort of the new life that had come to the town with Picasso's appearance there. It was the printmaker Arnera who suggested lino cut for these posters, uh, using a, a scrap of linoleum, a sheet of linoleum that could be cut into much like you would a block of wood to make a woodcut uh, to make these posters. It's a very easy medium to work with, certainly compared to wood. Uh, it's very soft, it's quite pliable, it's quite forgiving to the cut. So Picasso started by making posters, much like these here, celebrating the ceramics fairs, the local pottery, and trying to advertise its wares and his presence there at the town. As 
he started working with these posters, as he started working with Linocut, he became much more aware of just how much he might be able to get out of the medium. And in a series of liner cuts he made over the next 10 years, he really expanded the boundaries of what could be done. Uh, he, uh, it is said, invented the reduction technique. Normally, if you wanted more than one colour on a, on a liner cut, you would have more than one block, a block per colour. You'd start with your, uh, your lightest background colours and work your way back towards the black colour, uh, like you might get on this poster. Picasso realised that's quite fiddly if you've got multiple blocks trying to get them to register. So he, it is said, invented this technique, the reduction technique, where you would cut every single different colour from the same block. You would start and work your way back. It was a very difficult way of working. You had to have a really clear idea of exactly what it is that you wanted your image to look like in order to be able to make your way back. If you made a mistake, there was no going back, there was no producing a new block, that was it. The image was done, you had to either live with that or scrap and start again. So you can see if we move on from these posters onto the couple here, this is where Picasso was starting to really get a feel for what he could do with the medium of liner cut and it really lent itself to his poster work, that beautiful rich flat colour um, lent itself perfectly, the, the, the themes, the subjects, the sort of the bacchanal uh, 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 parties, uh, these wonderful figures of, of Jacqueline, his, his, uh, his wife, his second wife, uh, and um, these sort of wonderful portraits of, of sort of musketeer heads. They lent themselves perfectly to that kind of celebratory theme. Like artist posters of the ballet pop period, Picasso didn't start necessarily by advertising just his own work. It was, it was sort of in collaboration with the town. It took a little while before museums were starting to use uh, posters that he'd produced, that he'd helped design to advertise his, his exhibitions before artist posters proper uh, were, were part of his, his work. This was much like the, the Belle Epoque poster artists of the, the late 19th and early 20th century. They were extraordinary artists, but they weren't necessarily making posters of their own work. They were making posters for shops, for products, for uh, whoever they were advertising for. If you come around this corner here, we can see two fantastic Picasso posters. And they present us with the two different ways, really, that Picasso could work at designing poster work. For a large number, he designed from scratch. He was extraordinarily generous with his time when it came to poster making, probably partly because of his ego. He liked the idea of, um, of, of producing work that was celebrating himself, that was um, sort of confident in his, his stature as this great artist, his apotheosis among the, the old masters. So he might draw up specifically a, a design straight for a poster. This is a, a, an original lithograph. Um, he's even written the text for the poster itself. This is entirely down to Picasso's design. Then, other types of posters, he would work closely with the printers. These were often uh, people like the Moulot Frere in Paris, the, the uh, preeminent lithographers at the time. And it would either be down to Picasso to select an image to celebrate whatever exhibition or event it was that he was, he was uh, advertising for, or he would work in collaboration with the printmakers themselves and they would select an image and make sure that it was printed to his standards. This is a, a very famous Picasso poster. It's one of our favourite here at the gallery. This wonderful image conjuring all of the, the beauty, the colour, the light, the warmth, the sort of exotic, heady glow of the south of France and the Côte d'Azur, as you can see down here. But more important than anything, really, poster work for Picasso, designing posters, whether it was from scratch or from works that he'd already painted and selecting them, selecting the typography, working with the printmakers. Producing posters gave Picasso this wonderful period of reflection. The last 10, 20 years of his career, as I said at the start of this broadcast, he had already essentially established everything that he'd done. He had already perfected these various different ways of working. He'd worked in etching, he'd worked in lithography, he'd worked as a, a painter in a numerous different schools, numerous different styles. He had broken all the boundaries. 
This last 10 years, in which there were so many exhibitions of his work, so many retrospectives, so many opportunities for reflection, revisitation, when he was making so many posters, each time he came to design a new one, it offered a new opportunity to either reinvigorate his recent work or to revisit work in the past. You can see that in these two posters here. We've got a picture from the very last years of his career, 1969, I believe, uh, and, and here from much earlier, 1923, showing the two very different styles of Picasso working in these two very different periods. This last period of, of Picasso's life, this last chapter of his life, really the grand subject, the great theme of his work was his legacy. Not just his legacy, but the idea of legacy, the idea that he was uh, this incredibly famous, incredibly well-respected, incredibly uh, inspirational artist who'd left behind him a, a, an enormous uh, legacy of work. He was trying to come to terms with that. We get lots of paintings like this one of grand musketeers, sort of Shakespearean elaborate portraits that were really um, a, a way of exploring this idea of his, his uh, cementing in the, in the art historical canon as this great artist. Compare that to something like one of these much earlier images and you can see that with every choice of poster, with every choice of design, he was rethinking what he'd left behind, rethinking what he produced. Picasso's posters are not just simply a, a, an album of, of greatest hits, it was really delving back into the back catalogue and coming to terms with exactly who he was as an artist and what he had left behind. You come around the corner with me here. We've got the largest Picasso poster that we've ever had at the gallery, that we've ever had the joy to, to work with. This fantastic piece designed in 1953 for an exhibition in Milan, certainly the largest Picasso that we've ever had here at the gallery. The story of Picasso's posters is not just one of his art, it is also one of his personal world, his, his private world and his relationships. This was designed in 1953. At the time, he was really just starting to explore the breadth of, of poster making. He produced a number of line cut posters advertising his various ceramics shows and exhibitions. This was a time of sort of exploring the medium. It was also a time that a major relationship in his life was breaking down. Françoise Gillot, who was a, a very established artist in her own right, was, uh, was leaving him. She left him over a long period, a period of two years it took her to come to the, to the decision. But they had children together. It represented a, a major chapter in his life. Picasso was famously not very good with the women in his life. He was a, an abuser, he was a megalomaniac. And I think there is an interesting thing happening in Picasso's posters, that at the same time that he's coming to terms with everything that he'd left behind him, with his work, with um, the great ego that was Picasso. He was also coming to terms with this breakdown in his life, this breakdown in his relationship, um, uh, and the, the, the various difficulties in the way that he treated women and lived with women. Gillot was one of the few in Picasso's life who got the opportunity to leave him, who um, really left with her head held high, who managed to survive Picasso. In fact, she's still alive today. But he was not kind to her. In fact, almost exactly the same time as he was producing this enormous portrait, uh, this enormous poster, she was uh, in the process of, of ending their relationship. And when she left, he would turf out her stuff, tell galleries not to stock her work. He found it very difficult, I think, given that she was an artist herself, to uh, leave on, on equal terms. I think that makes a work like this all the more poignant, though, all the more powerful. He was discovering in these subjects, these bacchanal subjects, particularly of the goat men with these satyr horns, uh, the, the beards, he saw a reflection of himself. He saw both the Picasso who, who reveled, who was creative, who knew no limits, who knew no inhibitions in his art, who was the master of his own domain, but also the violent side of him, the dangerous side of him, the side of him that he couldn't control necessarily, um, the side of him of which he was perhaps in private ashamed. 
I think this is a, a really powerful poster. It says everything about Picasso's art. It says everything uh, about the complexity that he could bring to so straightforward a subject and so simple an image. This is pure Picasso, black and white, the gestures there on the page. It's been enlarged by the printmakers. It has this wonderful presence. The ego of the, of the, the name at the bottom in red. Really, it's in a poster like this, or any of the others that we've seen, that you capture in what should have been for him a fairly throwaway project, a fairly throwaway uh, aspect of his work. You can capture the soul of the man in a single work. I think that was, um, for all his faults, the genius of Picasso. That in everything that he did, he put all of himself into it. He gave himself wholly to it, even in something like poster design, which so many artists could have simply passed off to the printmakers, to the uh, exhibitors, to the galleries themselves. That's really the story behind some of the posters that we've seen today, that coming to terms with these various aspects of his career and his person. I think it's reflected in the work, but I also think that they make for really remarkable uh, objects you know, in, the, in the home. They've got this wonderful presence to them. This is Picasso at his very best, trying to celebrate his very best. Roderick Barrett is an artist we've been championing for a number of years now. We've held a, a number of his paintings uh, over the last two decades. He's an artist who is little known outside of uh, his um, sort of uh, his, his core fans, um, but one who really should be much more widely known in, in the history of, of British art of the last hundred years or so. Part of the reason for um, his reputation, his legacy, not reaching as many people as it ought to, is that he spent almost his entire life as a teacher of art. He was a fantastically uh, generous and gifted teacher. And a number of his pupils uh, have um, been on record saying how, how wonderful his teaching was, how different it was to many other artist uh, teachers that they met in the various art schools that Barrett taught at. Hopefully this wonderful book by David Buckman will have changed somewhat, um, got his name out there a bit more, and we're going to keep pushing his work because we think it's really quite fantastic. Though he lived in um, the beautiful Essex countryside for a number of years, Roderick Barrett was never a landscape painter. He was always a, a painter uh, of the inside world, whether that's um, the interior domestic world of living rooms and kitchens, or the inside world of the mind. His is really a, a landscape of imagination in his paintings. His paintings dance a, a line, uh, quite a fine line between social realism, he was quite the idealist, quite the socialist. Um, in fact, he was a conscientious objector in the Second World War. And um, the mysteries, the fantasies of, of the human mind. This is one of a number of paintings uh, of an interior scene. And what Roderick Barrett was so good at doing was taking the everyday objects of everyday life. Uh, the tables and the chairs, the pots and pans in a kitchen, uh, candles in a room, and making them signify emotions, people, uh, the lives of the people behind these objects. So, for example, chairs are often taken to represent people. Upturned chairs, like this one, perhaps an argument. Um, there's a wonderful sort of rearrangement of the... Um, the geometry of this chair. It's quite sort of uh, Picasso-esque. It's sort of stretching uh, the, the natural boundaries of, of a realistic picture. I've had the very great pleasure of this painting hanging for a little while now in this back room where I've been working. And I've got to look up at it every day and, and sort of take in a bit more of it uh, every day I come into work, every time I, I sit down at my table and start working. Roderick Barrett's paintings have that kind of quality, that slow release. You can live with them for a number of years, work with them for a number of years, as we have done here at the gallery. And the longer you look at them, the more you find, the more interpretations, the more you feel this image sort of has some kind of significance, some importance for you. That's a really wonderful, powerful quality to, to a painter that a painter can have. And I think Barrett had it in spades. His paintings have this, this ability to 
inspire new stories every time to make you find new things to look at. This is a really beautiful one, a lovely manageable scale in a, in a domestic uh, scene. It would look lovely on a wall at home. I'm glad to have been able to introduce you to it today. <laughs>